Our first speaker this afternoon is, is John Wynn. John uh, was a member of the inference group for his PhD. He was co-advised by David and, and by Chris Bishop. Um, I, I didn't get the chance to overlap very much with, with John uh, during, uh, during my graduate work, but I have this very pleasant memory of John uh, in which when I was a prospective student visiting David and trying to think about where I wanted to do my PhD, he gave me uh, a, a tour of the Cambridge area and I remember very distinctly as a, sort of the first moment where I started to fall in love with, with Cambridge and, and, and this place. Uh, John has done a lot, of, uh, a lot of great work and creative work along, uh, along several different dimensions. Uh, today, he's going to tell us about democratizing data science. Great. Thank you, Ryan. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. Excellent. So I just want to say uh, it's a real privilege and an honor to, to be talking here today amongst such auspicious uh, company. Um, and so I thought I'd take the chance, rather than talking about some specific piece of work, for, was to step back uh, and talk about uh, um, really my, my whole research career and look back at what um, I've been working on and I suddenly sort of realized a little bit about what I should have been working on and so I'll talk a bit about that uh, as well. So uh, the title of my talk is, is Democratizing Data Science and what, what do I really mean by that? Well, something we hear a lot about these days is, is how much data there is around in the world. And uh, I'm actually allergic to the phrase big data, but it does seem to be that there is quite a lot of data happening these days. And, and I've got quite a lot of personal experience of people coming to me and saying, I suddenly find myself with quite a lot of data that I'm not really trained and don't really know what to do with. Um, and one particular, you know, I've got a few examples of this that, that actually happened to me uh, over the last 15 years. And uh, one of them was that we had a in Microsoft, we have an ecology, uh, we had an ecology group, and they were interested in modeling trees. And so they needed to get some data, or needed to use data about trees. And the historical way that that had been done um, is like this. So uh, someone goes up to a tree, and they measure it. And needless to say, this doesn't lead to an overwhelming amount of data, um, because it takes time to go up to a tree uh, and measure its height, for example. And then recently, uh, in the last uh, few years, they've switched to a different method for modeling, uh, for getting data about tree growth, um, which involves one of these. And this is a, uh, obviously a helicopter, and, and underneath it is a uh, LIDAR, uh, a laser scanning device. And using one of these, you can get something like this. And you can measure every single tree in a state. So now you've gone from tens of trees to an entire forest. And this situation in, in climate science um, is mimicked in, in many other situations. So another example of uh, where people have come to me with, with uh, new data sets is in looking at, at complex diseases. And this example is cystic fibrosis. And previously, the sort of data that you would have from cystic fibrosis patients is on the order of monthly clinic visits. And this is a, a patient breathing into a, a lung function machine. And I'm now involved in a, um, in a study called Smart Care, where um, we have all these little devices uh, that can track the activity, uh, uh, lung function, uh, blood oxygen, weight, symptoms, and so forth of an individual on a daily basis, or even multiple daily basis. And so where previously there'd be a handful of data points for a patient, um, we're now sort of overloaded, or the, the clinicians are overloaded with with all of this rich data. Um, and then switching to, um, uh, I work for Microsoft, so switching into sort of more of the uh, Microsoft and software development world. You know, back when we had this, was what we meant by mail or post, um, you know, you prioritized it by getting the round filing cabinet and, uh, and sorting things into it. Um, and now we're in this world and uh, so I've been working with the Office 365 team uh, in Microsoft, um, and they process petabytes of emails every month. Um, and they want to be able to help people prioritize their, their mail. And again, they didn't have the training or the skills to, to do that. And so how can we help these people who are sort of coming from all these different uh, areas? So we saw scientists, 
We saw doctors, software developers, as their technical experts who are suddenly finding themselves with a lot of data that they're not quite sure what to do with. So and in an ideal world, we could just have a ton of data scientists, um, and we can give a data scientist to, to each of these people, and they can go off and, and spend a year looking at their data sets and helping them understand their data sets. But the problem is we do not have enough data scientists. So um, how can we, the, the, the idea behind democratizing data science is other ways we can take these highly skilled, educated people, doctors, engineers, um, scientists, and can we provide them with the skills themselves uh, to do data science? So um, in order to think about that, uh, how to answer that question, we need to think, what is doing data science? And I'm going to describe particularly sort of the machine learning aspects of data science. And in my mind, there's sort of two aspects here. There's the what, which is when, I'm, when I have my problem that I'm working on, um, what data should I gather uh, to address my problem? Uh, what variables should I include? How should I encode that data? How should it be represented? Um, and what assumptions should I make about the relationships between uh, data, different data points between different variables? And, and put together all of those what's make a, a model of everything that I'm saying or everything that I'm assuming um, about the world. And that's kind of the what part of doing data science, doing machine learning. And then having sort of said very precisely what it is uh, that you're assuming about the world, then there's the how part. And the how part says, how can I, having made all these assumptions, having got this data, how can I then do learning? How can I then learn about the domain, uh, whether that's forest, forest growth, or whether that's medicine, cystic fibrosis, how can I learn about that domain? How can I make predictions in that domain? And for large amounts of data, how can I even run fast enough to do learning and to make predictions in a short enough time to be useful? And so the idea behind democratizing data science is that we want to try and work towards automating or assisting with these two, two halves of the data science problem. And so the ideas that you might have for doing that on the what space are making it really easy to edit and create and share models. Um, and we've seen in terms of sharing models, the, the 2050 climate models being a, a lovely example of making it really easy to edit and share some model of, uh, of the world, in that case, a climate model. Maybe auto-suggest models if you're given some data. That's another idea of sort of making the what part of this easier. And then having got some initial model, making it really easy to test, debug, refine, and improve that model. And the how part of the space, uh, it's really about automatically doing inference. It's really about having got your definition of the problem, being able to then go out and doing it automatically. And of course, by, by running those numerical calculations, in order to do it quickly enough, we need to be able to use the hardware appropriately, so it might be automatic parallelization. So these are all very sort of hard problems that would need to be solved um, to truly sort of enable data science for um, sort of your average technical professional. So um, I now want to step back and uh, think back to the beginning of my research career when I started my PhD, and I was working uh, originally in MIT, and then I did an internship with Chris Bishop in Microsoft Research in Cambridge. And I wanted to come to Cambridge to, to complete my PhD. Um, but I couldn't sit in Microsoft, because um, Microsoft doesn't give PhDs. So Chris suggested that I should come and, and sit in uh, the group of David Mackay, who, uh, it seems, sat in the physics department. And, and this seems like a strange idea to me. I should go and sit in the physics department to learn about machine learning. Surely uh, computer science or engineering would be the place, but no, uh, uh, the physics department. So I was a bit skeptical, but I, 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 um, I came along, and I soon saw the light. Um, <laughs> and I have to say, my, my first impressions of, of David was um, an incredibly warm welcome uh, to the group. 
and of his uh, uh, amazing, he was amazingly bright. Um, and then as I settled into the group and, and um, uh, began to sort of get involved in uh, the uh, weekly meetings that we had, it became clear, firstly, that David had a huge amount of energy and just a constant source of, of ideas. And then the sort of the lasting thing that's, that's, that um, has stayed with me, really, was that I had all these ideas about machine learning and about modeling and about, um, about inference. And really, David helped me put these all together um, and really sort of shone a light on and enlightened me as to how everything fitted together in a way that's, that's really stayed with me for, for the rest of my career. And I just want to say thank you very much for, for that. So with, this, with, with the clarity of thought coming from being in David's group and being in that exciting environment, um, I set about sort of doing what, in retrospect, I'm going to call trying to democratize data science. And uh, the output of, of, of my PhD was a, a software program called Vibes. Um, and it's actually, I went to the website to check, and you can still download it. It's uh, uh, 13 years later, it's still available to, to download, and you can still play with it. And what it is, is a software, it's a visual software tool where you can drag and drop a, uh, a model um, in, in the space. Um, and then when you want to actually run inference in that model to make predictions or do learning, um, you just press the start button and it goes off and, and does it. So that, that seems like uh, a nice, uh, friendly way of doing things. But if I were to critically assess uh, this, this program, I would say there's, there's two issues with it on the what and the, uh, the how front. So on the what front was it made us a nice editor, but it didn't tell you uh, what to build for the problem that you were trying to solve. So it just made it easy to build stuff, but didn't particularly tell you what to build. And in terms of the how, there were actually fairly few things that you could build that would actually work. <laughs> so, so really, in terms of sort of success rate, I'm going to give myself like kind of low on both, on both axes. But it was an exciting, really exciting uh, area to work in. And I thought to myself, I don't think I can keep working on sort of both aspects of this, um, I want to sort of focus in on just the how part and then really focus in even more, uh, just look at how we can do automatic inference. Because um, it seemed like this is something that would be really useful for, uh, for helping people to solve machine learning and data science problems. And so um, when I finished my PhD, I moved to Microsoft, and re Microsoft Research in Cambridge. Um, and in the first few weeks, I met this amazing guy called Tom Minka. And between us, we discussed um, what it would look like to, to build an automatic inference engine. And out of that came uh, the initial uh, requirements for something which became known as infer.net. And this has been what I've worked on literally ever since. So, it's, uh, it's an automatic inference system. And so if you think about uh, info.net as, as sort of helping with the how part uh, of data science, then you, you assume that you've already done the what part. You've already specified precisely what uh, the model is, what the set of assumptions are, what the variables are, what the data is um, that you want to do with. And that has to be sent into uh, your inference framework in some form. And over the years, what we've realized, um, uh, we came to realize was that the, the form that we think is the right form, or uh, certainly a good form for that, is something called a probabilistic program. So I want to just talk briefly um, about what on earth a probabilistic program is. So to, to sort of try and give you some intuition about probabilistic programming, um, I want you to imagine uh, that um, <coughs> Uh, we have some Microsoft source code here, which I'm sharing with you. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, the lawyers said I couldn't share all of it, so we blacked out uh, some... They're not important, don't worry. <laughs> Bits of the source code. Uh, so what you can see 
the parts that you can see, so you have um, a string A um, equals something, a string B equals something, and then we're going to stick them together with a space. Um, oh, I hope I remembered the exclamation marks, and some exclamation marks, and then just write it out. Now, because this is our software, you can buy it from us and run it. <laughs> and when you run the software, this is what happens. It says, hello, uncertain world. Um, and so does anyone want to tell me what was blacked out? What was under the blackout? <laughs> Brave people or people who've heard this talk before. Fantastic. So that's certainly one option. <laughs> it is an uncertain world we live in. And so the other option uh, is um, that uh, the space is the, is the second space. Um, and then we have hello uncertain and world. And so you, what you just did was inference in a probabilistic program. So the probabilistic program was um, you have some unknown variables in the program, you see the output of the program, and then you work backwards to say, huh, those are what the values are. But when you work backwards like that, you have to cope with uncertainty. And so this is the sort of hello world program for probabilistic programming. So we can take that example and write it in infer.net. And so it looks very, very similar. Um, you, you have uh, this new operator. Actually, this is, this is a slightly modified version of, of infer.net. I should be completely upfront. That's where we want it to go. Uh, so this new operator called random. And what random does, it says create a random variable. Um, so you can also think about it as random sampling. So what the first one says is, I'm going to pick a random string from all possible strings. Yep. Got that? So pick a string from all possible strings. And then the second line does the same thing, another string from all possible strings. But, but they're still strings, so we can still work with them. So then we can um, uh, do normal concatenation operations. Um, and then we can observe the result. And this, this is, adds a new operator, observe, which says, having done something, the result is this. So it's not assignment, it's, it's, it's saying, I, I know that having done the above lines, um, the result is this. So it says observe that having done these computations, C is hello uncertain world. And um, then you can use this magic infer command to invoke the inference engine and say, give me back a probability distribution over A and over B. And if you do that, in infer.net will tell you 50% hello uncertain, 50% hello and 50% world, 50% uncertain world. And you don't have to believe me, you can download it and try it out for yourself. So this is, this is obviously a simple hello world example. Um, so uh, if I just, uh, I'll come to some more complex examples in a second. Let me just talk a little bit more about those three operators. So just as a reminder, normally when you're writing a program, every variable has a fixed single value. But in probabilistic programming, we can have these random variables. And you can think of these as stuff I don't know. But because we're Bayesian, even stuff I don't know, I'm going to put a prior over. And that's, that's what goes inside the random part. And then the observations, as I said, observe means I observe this to be true. It, doesn't, it means that having done the lines of code above, this, true, this is true. Think of it more like a cert, except that it has these amazing backwards effects. And then the final part is inference, the, the invoking the inference engine part, which says, for a random variable, what is the distribution, the probability distribution over its values? And so an example that combines a, a couple of these things is that if I say I have some integer, which is a number between 1 and 10, and then I'm going to define another random variable from that one by saying I'm going to square that variable and see if it's greater than 50, infer the result, and the result is there's a 30% chance of being true 
70% chance of being false, or Bernoulli 0.3. So if you think going back now to data science, what kind of things do data scientists, what kind of things do people like to do with data? Well, one very standard thing people like to do is sort of regressions. So here's a linear regression written in a probabilistic programming language. And you'll see there's you know, about four lines of code here that really do anything. So firstly, um, we're saying there's some uh, parameters of our line, A and B, which we don't know, which is what we want to find out. And so we use random to say they're random variables. And we put some really broad, in this case, Gaussian priors. And then we're going to loop over our data. And so first of all, we kind of um, say that uh, some idealized version of our y coordinate uh, is equation of a line a times x plus b. But we can't assume that our data is going to lie perfectly on a line, so we can add some noise um, and then observe the result to be equal to the actual data. This is where observed lines bring in the actual data. And then if we want to do inference, if we want to then fit that line to our data, um, we just use the infer command. And out comes the slope and the intercept with appropriate uncertainty according to the amount of data you have and so forth. And if you wanted to, you can go back now and make it more fancy. You can have random variables for the amount of noise, for example. So that was a, a simple um, example. And I now want to sort of look at a more real example. This is a slightly old one now, but I like it because it's uh, it, it's actually something that's shipped in Microsoft. So, um, I don't know if anyone's ever played this game. It's Halo, one of the most popular. Thank you, Charles, for being honest there. Um, it's one of the most popular games on the Xbox platform. And one of the reasons it's popular is you can go online and play against other people. And when you do, you get a good experience. And, and part of that good experience is, a, is due to the matchmaking. So matchmaking is that you get to play someone who's about as good as you are. Because if you play someone who's much better, that's definitely a not going to give you a good experience. If you play someone who's much worse, that's not going to give you a good experience either for a different reason. And so in order to do that matchmaking, um, you have to track how good um, all the players of, of Halo are. And uh, there's millions of Halo matches a day. There's thousands and thousands of players billions of hours of gameplay. And so this is a, definitely a large scale um, lo inference problem with lots of data. And this was originally solved by hand, took months of work, and, and the algorithm was written in hundreds of lines of code. And the, the basic idea behind um, what is done is that the system holds at any particular time a set of estimates of how good everyone is as a numerical value. Um, and then a particular game happens, say a game between these three players, Sully, Sniper, I, and, and Dr. Slowplay, and there's some outcome of that game. And based on that outcome, uh, we can update and get new estimates of the skill. So you can think of that pictorially. So here we have Gaussian distributions for each player saying how good they are. So the way to read this is that for the yellow player, Sniper, I, we're very confident that he's got a high uh, skill around 30. And then for Dr. Slowplay, we're less confident that he's a less good player around 20. And then this third player, Sully, we don't know much about at all. So maybe they're just a brand new player. And then the game is played, and Sully comes first, Sniper Eye comes second, Dr. Slowplay comes third. And then we need to update the skills based on uh, that outcome. And so the first thing you might think of is to look at Sully. Well, now he's beaten Sniper Eye, so it seems much more likely that his skill is up above Sniper Eye's skill. And because we had little idea about his skill originally, it's going to make a really big move um, in that bump. Sniper Eye, we were already pretty confident about what his skill was. He's lost to, to Sully, so he, his, his bump will move down, but it will move down very little. Um, and similarly, somewhere in between, uh, for Dr. Slowplay. And you can imagine building quite a complex algorithm to cope with all the situations of all the different numbers of players and coping with draws and all this kind of stuff. Um, but if you have a probabilistic programming language, you can just describe the process of playing the game. 
So let me show you what I mean by that. So this is the probabilistic program for the, the true skill system um, that, that actually ship in its simplest possible form. But still, it fits on a slide. And so the idea is that um, coming into this code, we have means and variances for each of the players. That's the original estimates of skill of the, of the three players, the ones coming in. Um, and then we say that each player's skill, um, sometimes they'll play better than their skills, sometimes they'll play worse. So you know, you have good days and bad days. So your actual performance in a particular game is, is a noisy version of your skill. So we're going to add some noise. And then uh, the players are coming in in order of first, second, third. So we'll just observe that the performance uh, of the previous player uh, is better than the performance of the current player. So it's putting a ranking on those actual performances. Um, and then you just infer back, sorry, you just infer back that skill array, and that does everything that we just, we just discussed. It takes into account um, uh, the, the ranking of the players in that game and adjusts automatically each of those uh, skill estimates uh, according to the uncertainty of the individual players um, and taking the observed um, outcome of the game into account in a handful of lines of code. So this is a very powerful way of instructing a, um, a machine to, do it, to, to, to make an inference about the world. Let's give one more real-world example. Well, okay, not real-world example, but kind of fun example that we can fit on a slide. Um, so we saw a lot of uh, talking about um, comp computational biology yesterday. Um, and so uh, uh, one of the, the tasks that comes up in computational biology is motif finding, so finding short segments um, of DNA that, that are indicative of particular things, um, like binding sites. And the problem with motifs is that they're not one particular sequence of nucleotides, they have uncertainty. And so the way they're expressed is using these beautiful diagrams which give sort of some indication of the likelihood in, in a particular instance of a motif that you'll have a particular uh, letter in each location. And so in the middle there, it says it's very likely to be AA, although other letters are, 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 are possible. And then perhaps on the second position here, C and A are roughly equally likely. And so below the, the motif picture, I've shown some example instantiations of that motif. And so motif finding, the idea is you want to learn the motif and find out where it is in the code at the same time. So what I've done is make some synthetic data here, and hidden inside this data are some motifs. And there's one in every sequence. So can everyone see the motifs in the sequence? Yeah? <coughs> Biologists in the room? It's quite a hard problem, right? So um, again, using a probabilistic program, uh, you can tackle this kind of problem in one slide of code. Um, so, uh, in this example, first of all, we, we generate the unknown motif. I'm not going to go in too much detail for time. Um, and then we're going to loop over the sequences. And then in each sequence, we're going to generate a motif instance. So that's the exact version of the motif that happens in that particular sequence. And you can see the randoms indicate all the unknowns. So there's the unknown motif, the unknown instance of the motif, and then the unknown position of that motif in the sequence. And then we can then glue that motif in place in the sequence and put on the left and right some uh, background uh, sequence. And then finally, we have the observe that says the true sequence is this, and it's equal to left plus motif plus right. So this is a motif finder in a slide of code. When we take that exact code um, and run it on this exact data, uh, then what you'd get is that. So it's found um, the motif. And in fact, because we can synthesize the data, we can check it. And in, um, in all, uh, all but one case, the most likely location, um, which I'm showing here, was actually the, the true location. And this is the the motif that was discovered. So it's a completely synthetic example, but it shows how powerful systems can be built using very small amounts of code. 
And so this is, um, I think, a, a really sort of exciting and compact way of building very sophisticated systems. Come on in. Um, the, the, the challenge um, is, is in this part, the InfiniteNet compiler. And this is the part that takes that probabilistic program and then inverts it automatically and solves the problem. And as you can imagine, you can write all kinds of probabilistic programs that are incredibly hard to solve. I mean, the most obvious example is if you write one to do encryption, then you won't be able to invert it because then you'd be able to decrypt the world's encrypted communications. Um, and so the, the, the secret source is in this block here, which takes the probabilistic program and produces a um, uh, source code, C-sharp source code, that, that then solves it. And I could spend a very long time talking about how that works, and I'm not going to do that at all. But I will just say that we've been working on this for 10 years, and lots and lots and lots of people have been involved. Um, and as a result, we now have a compiler that can compile probabilistic programs well enough that we can solve a whole range of problems. And so I just want to give some flavor of the kinds of things that the people have used the Info.net compiler for. So a very broad range of problems uh, in biology, in medicine, uh, in machine vision, in text analysis, all kinds of problems can be solved uh, by writing um, a prob the right probabilistic program and then using um, uh, this compiler to actually do your learning or make your predictions. And so we're definitely not all the way there. There's a lot of probabilistic programs that don't run and a lot of machine learning things that people do that you can't run on info.net. But a, a decent proportion of problems that, that real people have in the world can, can now be solved with this compiler. So I'm, give, I'm giving myself like 60 or 70 percent. I'm giving you 60 or 70 percent on the how front. You know, there's a decent proportion now of problems that can be solved. If only you have the right probabilistic program to, to feed into the compiler. Um, and here's the really big problem, which is when you go to a scientist or a doctor or an engineer and say, please write your probabilistic program to, to feed into our compiler to solve your problem, you get this. They get, they, this, is a, this is something that people don't know how to do. They don't have experience of it. Um, and uh, as a result, the number of people who can actually write these things that will be useful is, is, is still too small. So though we've, we've sort of helped with, with a big part of the democratizing data science problem in that you're not having to spend months actually writing algorithms anymore, you still have the problem of writing the probabilistic program. So what I realize now is that having spent 10 plus years working on infer.net, I now need to start reorientate myself and perhaps spend the next 10 plus years working on this top part, the what. Like where can we get these, these uh, probabilistic programs from uh, that we can do inferencing? Um, and so just for the, the last few minutes of the talk, um, I want to just give some uh, ideas uh, that, that, that we've had, but none of this, or very little of this is my work. Um, and I just want to uh, talk through sort of the kinds of approaches that, that may help with this part of the problem. But I think this is actually the very, uh, before how was a very difficult problem, but now what is the very difficult problem? So um, one way of, of helping people is just rather than having them, having to write the probabilistic program or model for themselves, you can pre-build a whole selection of them and just, they can just pick them and try them out. And so in Microsoft, we have this thing called Machine Learning Studio, where you can sort of drag and drop existing models, some of which were built using infer.net, uh, onto um, an experiment and, and quickly build up reproducible, shareable experiments uh, that, you can, that you can give to others. And, and I think that's kind of nice, but I don't think that's solving all of the problem. 
There's also higher level machine learning APIs that do things like text analytics and face recognition and translation. And again, these are, these are very, very easy to use APIs for developers, uh, but they're not solving the whole problem because they're not very customizable. Another exciting direction is, is automatic model suggestions. So most of the data that people have is in Excel. And so there's been some work with by Andy Gordon uh, um, in MSR Cambridge to look at the structure of data in the spreadsheet already and kind of auto-create a model around that data structure. And then what it does is it builds a probabilistic program under the hood and calls infer.net. And I think this is a really exciting direction. Not only does it do that, it then puts the resulting program in a, in a nice readable form in your spreadsheet so you can then edit it and improve it. So I think that, that's a really sort of a promising idea. And, um, and also, in terms of automatic model suggestion, we have Zubin uh, and uh, Josh Tenenbaum working in the area of the automated statistician. And the idea here, again, is, is that you automatically work out what the model is from the data. And this is looking at time series models and trying to discover what the components of the model, the components of the process that gave rise to the time series are. And the other exciting sort of concept here is then producing a nice report automatically in plain English um, about, about your data and about what the uh, 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 structure of that data is. And the other thing I think that is just a really a whole new area that is, we're barely scratching the surface of is all the tools and environment around probabilistic programming. Uh, so this is some work I learned about only uh, on Sunday uh, with um, uh, various people who are in the audience um, and, uh, and Don Sign, who's at uh, MSR Cambridge. And it's about sort of starting to build editing coding environments for probabilistic programs. And so you have the probabilistic program in the top left and then the graphical version of that, uh, which is very useful um, for visualizing the relationships between variables uh, coming in next door. And then you can also run inference using infer.net and then, and then get back your distributions sort of right next to your code. And I think we can really build some super exciting things around this space. So if you think about when you write ordinary software, you have all these tools to help you. You have debuggers, you have profilers, but in probabilistic programming, we don't have these things. Um, so I think having more tools for helping us criticize our model. I know David has, has expressed a lot of interest in having better tools for model criticism. Um, so why is my model not matching well to my data? Wouldn't it be great if we had tools that says, your model matches really well here, but not so well over here? Or you have a really good model, but actually inference isn't working well. Can I debug that? Can I, can I even detect that? Another thing is, the problem is that not many people, so many people don't know how to write probabilistic programs, or maybe we can train them to do it. Um, and so another idea is, let's get out there, let's make uh, books. So I've got a book um, on how to write probabilistic programs, um, and, and let's build courses uh, and change the curriculum so that people really can start to think of writing probabilistic programs in the same way that writing ordinary programs has, has now exploded in terms of the number of people that can can do this. And then sort of e thinking even more crazily, um, and this is sort of ideas I'm starting to have around uh, even more levels of automation, is if people just put their data sets up on the web, if I have a model, I could go and suck up all the data sets on the web, try and fit my model to all of them. And there's a sort of slightly sarcastic term in, in machine learning, which is data set selection, which is when you have a cool new idea, you find the data set that it works for. And it's always been seen as a negative. But maybe we can make this a positive. Maybe we can take your model and your, and your inference idea and search all the data in the world and find the, one, the, the data sets that it really works for and then email those people and say, hey, this model works really well for your data. <laughs> so I think, I think there's like lots of room here for really creative ideas around helping people to understand their data um, and, and getting uh, <coughs> new techniques, new machine learning techniques out there. So one last sort of inspiring uh, example. Um, so the, the learning the, the, the structure of proteins, protein folding, 
was seen as this really hard problem that only experts could work on. And, and, and it required really advanced knowledge of optimization, uh, of chemistry, and of physics. And then they came up with this program called Folded. And Folded makes that into a game. And so in this game, your goal is to, is to find a good structure uh, for a folded protein. And they have found um, and discovered uh, the actual structures of proteins using this tool with you know, everyday people coming along who have no training uh, in, um, in, in protein folding, uh, coming in and spending hours and hours and hours playing this game um, and, and doing science and, and uh, uh, making world-breaking discoveries um, without having uh, extensive training at all. And I think this is an inspiring example of if you build your tools well enough, then anyone can use them. And could we build something like Foldit for doing machine learning, for doing data science? I think that would be an amazing goal to work towards. So just to wrap up, in terms of where we're at with democratizing data science, I think on the how front, uh, we're doing pretty well. There's, there's uh, more to go. And of course, as people want to do more things, uh, that gets harder. But on what, on helping people automatically choose what method to use and what model to use, um, we've got a really, a really long way to go. So I think that's a really exciting area. And I encourage everyone to, to, to look at that. So, thanks very much. What Ian's setting up, why don't we have a time for a question? This one over here. Hi, John. So you mentioned the prospects of putting your data sets on the internet for everybody to see and then maybe making it possible to test kind of a wide range of models on a wide range of data sets. Um, that brings to kind of like, you know, the question, like how do you tell people what's in a data set that you put on the internet? So like sometimes you have, you have features and labeled examples, but sometimes actually knowing kind of what the structure of your data is is quite important. And so what are your thoughts on kind of like how we can make it easier for people to kind of publish data sets in a way that, you know, we can relate what's in the data to maybe like also another data set? I think that's a really good question. Um, so. I think there's sort of two ways of putting up data, or rather, when you put up data on the web, um, I guess in your head you might think get some Excel file or, or even just some you know, pure data file and stick it up. But when people put data files up on the web, they put them up for humans to, to use. So generally, when you put some file up on the web, you'll also put up a document describing what the file is and how to use it and so forth. Um, and uh, and that will, they won't just be the data in isolation. So if we could build systems that sort of entity extraction systems that could go onto the web and pull out not only the, the data, but the metadata and the description of the data and understand that and annotate that data, then I think that would provide the extra level of information that, make, that might make it possible to start to do this kind of crazy idea. But it's, yeah, it's, it's hard. Listening, John, again. <laughs>